Okay, I want to thank everybody for joining us for today's uh, webinar as part of this um, you know broad-based uh, webinar uh, series that Asterix has been putting on now since um, since we're actually coming up on about six seven months we've been going back to, to the August time frame for when we kind of kicked this off and we're bringing in thought leaders from around the globe on lab informatics and laboratory technology and today's um, speaker is is certainly one of those in plan domino the topic is capacity planning and scheduling for the laboratory why schedule uh, why now and why digital uh, this is going to be presented by plan domino we can go to the next slide greg but before we get into uh, your introduction let me just do a quick introduction of who asterix technology is for everybody uh, so you can get a sense of what we're all about and then we'll turn it over to the capable hands of greg to finish up the presentation so First and foremost, uh, who we are, we're an informatics professional services and strategic outsourced solutions company. Uh, we are 100% dedicated to the life science community. Uh, we were established in 1995, privately held company that originated as the IT division of a firm called APBI Life Science, which was a life science research organization. Uh, today, we operate from seven offices in the United States and beautiful Costa Rica, and we are headquartered in Red Bank, New Jersey. The companies that we work with, we work with Fortune 1000 Life Science Enterprises, chemical companies, CPG, government, uh, and research institutions, all with large and fast-growing IT or outsourced and compliance needs. <clears throat> Our mission has and always will be to deliver scalable, sustainable solutions for the scientific uh, community. And one of the things that we do, you can go to the next slide, Greg, one of the things that we focus on very heavily here uh, at Asterix is uh, services that span the complete life cycle of scientific data systems, right? And never before in, 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 in the history of just laboratories in general have there been this explosion of, of technologies and new technologies and movement from, you know, traditional client server computing to cloud computing, et cetera. So there's just a lot going on and even the advent of AI. Um, what we do is we try to help laboratories really kind of figure out what their technology stack should be. And we do that through business process analysis and enterprise architecture work. Those are kind of the first two spokes uh, of, of the solutions that we're doing. Uh, we're helping you figure out what technology you really need and how this technology should be built uh, to optimize getting your products to market or your services to market. And then we do laboratory technology selection services. We go out and we have established relationships with many vendors in the space so that when it is time to figure out which technology, we can bring the right vendors in so that you can evaluate them and help you run that evaluation professionally and fairly. And then we can help do the development implementation and then on the back end, the computer system validation of these systems. Finally, as part of a services, uh, we, we can bring um, services to bear to help you maintain these systems uh, and even run these systems on a regular basis update, upgrade, train, et cetera. Uh, and then we can even go as far as staffing of folks in your organization to maintain these systems or just staff regular scientific personnel. So that's a little bit about who we are. We'll go ahead and stop that. I want to put the presentation in the capable hands of Plan Domino today. So let me do a quick introduction of our speaker today and go to the next slide. And then Greg Heaslip is the CEO and founder of Plan Domino. Greg, I hope I got your last name correct. Uh, he brings a yep. PhD in mechanical engineering, a serial entrepreneur, and former senior consultant of BSM EF ESO, specializing in lean systems for QA and QC. So, Greg, take it away. I'll come back on the back end and wrap us up, but it's in your hands now. Okay. Thanks very much, Kevin. And uh, a big thank you to Asterix Technology for uh, inviting us to present here today. Uh, so, as Kevin mentioned, um, I'm a former um, BSM consultant, and uh, it, around 20 years ago, uh, BSM developed the Lean Lab uh, system. Um, in uh, one, they were they were a regular Lean uh, Lean kind of consulting group uh, that were asked to go into a laboratory, and they 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 developed these things called trains and rhythm wheels, and uh, you know leveling flow and standard work, basically specifically for laboratories. And I worked uh, primarily, as I said, in QC and a little bit did a little bit of QA work. And around uh, 2015, uh, we saw that um, you know there were some clients starting to ask about digital solutions. And so in 2017, I left uh, BSM to set up this company called Plan Domino, which is essentially uh, the goal of, of, of Plan Domino was to digitize those lean systems um, and to create a digital version of the of the lean laboratory. And around uh, this time last year, uh, we started a conversation with a company called Binox. Um, and uh, we discovered essentially that Binox were creating the same, same product as us, uh, but they were three or four years ahead of us. Um, and after some negotiation, we decided basically to join forces with Binox. And actually, we're, we're making an announcement today. So Asterix uh, uh, webinar series is getting this, the big scoop here today. 
um, we're uh, we're joining forces with Binox, and uh, we're becoming a part of their uh, uh, part of their ecosystem. Um, so, um, just to just to give a little bit of background, they're they're basically um, uh, it's a consulting company called Blue Crooks, and Binox came out of of uh, an, a, a co-creation with uh, GlaxoSmithKline. Um, and um, you know we've we've got a offices across. We also offices in New Jersey um, and Ireland, UK office, and two offices in uh, Belgium. Um, and so, I suppose with that in mind, um, you know the, the talk today really is about scheduling um, and capacity management. And there's an obvious kind of relationship between the two of them. Uh, having a having a good scheduling system uh, will drive a good capacity management system and it's maybe difficult to see how you can manage capacity if you don't have your uh, your standard work um, and you don't have a good uh, understanding of your operations and the kind of workloads uh, that you're trying to manage in your laboratory that will all drive your capacity management um, and so uh, with that in mind maybe uh, there's probably a lot of people on the call who haven't seen maybe a laboratory um, uh, scheduling system um, or a capacity management system for a, for a laboratory. So I thought we'd just start off with a couple of screenshots. Um, and I suppose we're, you're probably familiar with these boards, uh, you know, with the analysts down the left-hand side and the days of the week across the top. Um, and essentially, you know, the scheduling system, for all intents and purposes, it looks very similar to that. Uh, it's a digital version of that. Uh, but obviously, I'll go on to explain that there's, there's obviously a lot more to it than that. And these, these digital boards, uh, these digital scheduling systems then feed into um, the capacity management uh, systems, which are really a, a visualization of of what's of what are the potential outcomes in the future and where are we going to run into trouble. Um, and it allows us to, uh, you know, put in some scenarios and to see how this uh, maybe a graph like like you see here. How is that graph going to change? You know, what what are we seeing that we're going to be? Uh, are we going to be late uh, on on particular batches? Or do we have enough capacity in a laboratory if we change something and so on? Uh, and I'll explain a little bit more about uh, about what that means. So for today's talk, um, uh, as as Kevin said, uh, we're going to try and answer these uh, these couple of questions. So why digital? Uh, why now? And also, I thought it might be valuable to put in a kind of a what to look for. So in other words, a, a buyer's guide or a, a, a tick box exercise for you that you can take away with you today. Uh, so if you are going to go and look for a system, uh, maybe uh, it's just a guide for you to go and and, and uh, help you in your in your um, in your purchasing requirements. Um, and then we'll we we'll go and look at some hard numbers um, after that, uh, based on the Binox uh, client uh, database. Uh, I suppose just to, to back up what we're saying about why digital, why now, um, and why is it that you might want to put in a, a digital scheduling system. So if we start off uh, really with our the the why digital, um, I suppose we're we're all under pressure, you know, really to get more from less, or 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 it may be the case that we're we're trying to speed up uh, our operations, and of course this is not just in in laboratories, this is across every industry, and. Digital transformation is really making some big promises um, uh, with with regard to this, and maybe traditionally, I suppose we uh, we applied the likes of uh, well lean systems across the board, but in the laboratory, uh, you know, we applied these lean laboratory systems, and you know some of the some of the results that came out of that were were pretty spectacular. I mean, you know, in 100% improvements in productivity, and um, you know, I mean. You know the, the the lean lab system really served served us very well for the last twenty years or so, um, but really the gains are starting to to plateau, um, and you know I suppose why why is that um, that uh, uh, that that's happening, and if we look really at what we're trying to do um, in the laboratory, um, you know as the numbers start to go up, you know ten, twenty, thirty, and you know some labs have analysts with numbers in the hundreds. Uh, we're we're trying to manage all these people. We're trying to schedule equipment, maintenance, reagents. Uh, there's a multitude of products. There's a multitude of variants of those products. Uh, there are a multitude of testing protocols and methods which change quite often. Um, and it's really a lot for the the human brain to think about. And I suppose really the human brain is not designed uh, to manage these things. Um, and really, you know, this is what this is what is an ideal job for for computerized systems. 
Um, and then, of course, when we think about scheduling, just in itself is a lot of work. But of course, we all know that things change quite often in the laboratory. And so, uh, you know, rescheduling can be a real bone of contention in every laboratory. And uh, not just not just the fact that it's, it's changing for uh, maybe deleting work that we've done already, uh, which makes us feel unproductive, but just in itself, it is a, a lot of actual work. Um, and of course, these systems need to be kept up to date, uh, which, which you know, um, on, a, on, a, on an ongoing basis, which can create a lot of work. Uh, so I'm, I'm sure this this image is maybe familiar to a lot of people who are who are in uh, in the laboratory space. Uh, you know, these 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 boards, uh, even though they've served us well in the past past, you know, um, if we lose somebody who manages these boards, you know, do they take that knowledge with them? Uh, you know, shuffling cards around, um, and uh, like, how do we get our, how do we get metrics out of these boards? Uh, it's very difficult, and uh, quite often, maybe the metrics that we do take out of them are, are maybe a little unreliable. Um, but equally, when we look at um, a digital system, so a, a system that's entirely digital, um, it we we also end up with with uh, with similar problems in that uh, you know a digital system really cannot consider. All of the nuances of the laboratory, um, and that can be that can lead to equal equally difficult uh, problems trying to manage it because it's basically an impenetrable system. And so the idea really of the uh, the cobot or the collaborative uh, kind of collaborative robotic system. And what what the co the cobot really allows us to do is is to have transparency, um, but, but also giving us control over the system. Um, yet we retain, you know, the, the number crunching abilities um, of the of the computerized or digitalized system. And I suppose, uh, you know, this has really been backed up by um, some of the early adopters of of um, of uh, digitalized um, uh, lab systems, as has been um, um, mentioned by you know McKinsey and Gartner. And I, I suppose you can see some pretty impressive numbers here with 60 to 7 percent uh, decrease of QC lab lead, lead times. 50% uh, reduction in overall QC costs, um, and obviously big boosts in, in productivity. Um, so I suppose um, uh, you know if, if we think about if we think about these these big gains, I suppose you know where where exactly are these gains uh, coming from? What what is this? How is it driving this value? Um, if we look at inside the lab, I suppose we can say that. Uh, you know, really, it's it's an increase in efficiency of lab analysts and instruments. Um, you know, we're digitizing that planning process, uh, and we're also, particularly for QC laboratories, you know, we're automating intelligent campaigning, um, uh, and that that's obviously driving efficiencies and service levels. And another thing uh, is this is to avoid ghost time. I, I know there's another term for it now, which I'll think of in a second, but. Um, I, anybody who's been on a management course um, in the last five years will have heard the, na the, the word clarity being mentioned. And I think that uh, um, a lack of clarity does drive a lot of productivity loss. And I think, I think that it, a lot of those uh, lack of clarity can be solved by a digital system because it is telling you what the priority is and what you should be doing um, on a daily basis. Um, and then if we look outside, Outside the lab, you know, like uh, increased planning adherence, uh, which we'll talk a little bit about later, um, and uh, uh, improvements in in our in our service levels, uh, shorter cycle times, um, and you know things like say we're we're we've got new product introduction introduction and we're getting those products out a week faster. That means we're having an improvement in in uh, cash flow as well. So maybe on to the second question. Uh, why now? Uh, why is now a good time uh, to start looking at these systems? I think really there are three uh, drivers for this, um, and the first one really is digital transformation, and not just digital transformation of the laboratory, but of of organisations in general. And you know the the digital strategy really is dictating that we need to connect the laboratory to the rest of the organisation, um, and. I, Obviously, you know, trying to get to that holy grail of um, of feeding into AI systems, and uh, maybe I mean, if we start off with with feeding data into machine learning systems, that's you know creating correlations for us, and ultimately going into AI systems, that's either going to help us make decisions or will actually make decisions for us in the future. 
and of course, as I mentioned earlier, you know, we're, we're all under pressure to get more from less. Um, and I think, you know, improving, um, uh, you know, the short term control on a daily basis. Um, and, you know, that, that's, that's definitely going to drive uh, productivity. And of course, the, this ability to integrate with other systems is also definitely driving efficiencies. And then the third reason really, I think, is why now is a good time is because there are mature systems now available, you know, with the likes of, of Binox. Um, they're now, not only are they available, but they're, they're affordable and, you know, they, they have a proven uh, track record. So I thought it may be a good idea to look at, uh, if you were considering so, such a system, um, to look at, uh, you know, what exactly would you like, would you want to look for in a digital system uh, if you were to consider um, putting such a system into your laboratory? Um, I think one of the, I think anybody who's been involved in digital transformation, maybe, I, maybe the industry 3.0 version of digital transformation, uh, one thing, one bit of, of, of of uh, thing that has come out of that, the, the, the feedback that has come out of that, is that integrations really have have uh, have, have driven up the costs for uh, for those systems because of how they were integrated. And if you're if you're looking at you know a, a really any system for your laboratory, you know they, it should be able to integrate easily with your other systems. And ideally, you should be looking at systems that are no code. I mean, there are low code systems out there, but uh, really, the no-code systems are are the best. You know, your, your your lab staff have enough on their plate without having to learn uh, new coding systems. Uh, so I think that's definitely a a, a non-functional requirement that you should be looking for. Uh, maybe this is a more obvious one, but um, you know they should have ISO twenty-seven thousand and one uh, for security purposes. Um, without that, I think you'll 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 probably run into trouble with your IT department uh, if you're trying to buy such a system. And then uh, the KPIs and reports, um, you know, they should be as configurable as possible and really have actionable metrics that are coming out of them. Like uh, really what you want to avoid is for, for your management to be spending time exporting data and manipulating it. Um, and ideally that, you know, you're, you're setting up uh, dashboards for, uh, for all levels of your organization um, uh, within your laboratory, whether it's at a global level or uh, whether it's just for a supervisor. Um, you don't want them um, spending time um, uh, exporting and manipulating. Um, you know, um, uh, obviously, we, we want to get them back to managing people um, uh, rather than managing Excel sheets. And then, uh, obviously, the system should be scalable, uh, both locally and globally. And I think, I think really, if, if you're talking about a cloud-based system, that that probably goes without saying um, that those systems are, are, are quite uh, easily scalable. And then the last one, um, I like. I do. I do know that some labs use um, uh, systems that are kind of generic, um, generic systems, and uh, maybe task management systems. And we would certainly suggest that you should veer towards uh, systems that are that are dedicated towards labs. Um, and um, I suppose, you know, you, you do run the risk of implementing a system that works for you now and then maybe that system that you're using um, they change their priorities um, and they change a feature that you're using and maybe it may become difficult in the future to use that application um, and uh, uh, I suppose you know by, by using a, a, a system that's dedicated to laboratories uh, reduces the risk of that happening. In terms of functional requirements um, when it comes to scheduling um, the system should allow for laboratory constraints, and I, saw, I suppose maybe a good example of this is that you know anybody who's doing prep and write up, an analyst doing prep and write up, um, if that needs a, a, to be reviewed by somebody different, um, you know that that the scheduling system doesn't end up scheduling uh, the review to the same person, um, and that should be all um, programmable or codable within the system. Um, it should be competence-based, uh, so tasks should be um, scheduled out according to people's um, competence and their training matrix. Uh, tasks should be should be should be able to break down tasks into smaller uh, smaller pieces uh, to allow for uh, the nuances and the, the complexities of your laboratory. And also priority management. I, I you know I, I know this is a big thing for some labs um, that 
you, we know that priorities change on a, on a regular basis um, and, and that uh, you know, things change in general um, on a regular basis and really you should be able to go into the system easily and change the priority of whether it's batches or, or projects that you're working on. And obviously uh, the, the manual override uh, options and this, this ties in with the whole uh, COBOT uh, uh, system that we mentioned earlier. And the last one then is, is, is you know, ideally the system should create flow and you know when you're talking to, to any of the, the vendors of these systems really uh, this, is a, this is a big one because uh, the scheduling system should always be trying to find the shortest path uh, for, uh, for tasks to, to, to flow through your laboratory. Um, you know, I, I could probably talk for maybe 20 minutes on flow, um, but it, it certainly is a very important aspect of your of a scheduling system and for a lean lean management system. Uh, you know, we certainly don't want a lot of work in progress in the laboratory, and if the if the scheduling system doesn't allow for that, uh, you know, you can you can you can run into trouble and it can cause all kinds of quality issues and uh, problems with review and so on. Uh, when it comes to capacity management, I, uh, one big thing would be um converting the forecast that we have uh converting that into something meaningful uh for our laboratory requirements so i suppose um a good example of this is is maybe in a qc lab where um a production have decided that they're going to produce 20 percent more of a particular product um you know what, what does that actually mean for the lab does that mean that there are going to be more batches or does that mean that they're going to increase the size of the batches um and those two options obviously have two uh, two different impacts on the laboratory uh, you know we have, I think most of us have experienced uh, smaller batch sizes um, over the last few years and this is this is having a big impact um, particularly on QC labs um, the, your capacity plan should be able to visualize your future so in other words uh, you know it, having that ability to, to, to view on a month by month or a week by week basis uh, what's your laboratory going to look like um, based on your forecasts uh, if you maintain the same level of maybe staffing or equipment or training and ideally then that if you if you do have those visualizations that you can run what if scenarios so for example um, if we do more training uh, if we introduce more equipment um, or if we have changes in staff uh, what will the future look like and what will a capacity our ability to, to, to service our, our customers, what would that look like in the future? And then uh, the last one then is really you should be able to, um, um, to manage short and long-term uh, scenario planning. So uh, obviously it goes without saying that uh, Binox ticks all these boxes, um, but uh, we don't want to go into a sales pitch here now, but um, um, obviously that may be obvious at this point. <laughs> Uh, so I thought at this point maybe it might be interesting to to look at um, some of the data and the statistical analysis that's been done at Binox, um, and uh, essentially uh, what, what Binox have done is they've 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 analysed KPIs of users um, from some of the early adopters. I.e., uh, these are users who have more than 24 months of data. Um, so if we look at the time frame, uh, basically it's before and after data. Um, and um, it's over a 24 month period. Um, it, it's specifically QC laboratories that are using Binox for day to day scheduling. Um, and obviously, they have a certain level of maturity, so they're, they've been using it for a while. Um, and there are two main uh, KPIs that we're going to look at there's throughput, uh, which is a measure uh, calculated, which is basically the, the number of tests performed um, during, a, during a particular team um, during that particular period. And then there's planning adherence, uh, adherence, so the proportion of tests delivered within the required time frame. So when we look at this graph, uh, normally what we would expect is for the line to go from top left-hand corner to bottom right-hand corner. So in other words, uh, what we would expect that if we increase our planning adherence, or if that's our goal, if we if our goal is to increase our planning adherence, um, what we would expect is that we'd have uh, we'd have a lower throughput. We'd, we'd reduce our throughput. Um, and equally, if we want to in increase our throughput, um, that we would uh, we probably wouldn't be hitting our our planning adherence targets. 
Um, but obviously we can see here with some of the data points, and this is just data points from one client here. Um, we've got, uh, with, with an increase in planning adherence, we also see that we've got increased throughput. Um, and so th these are monthly, uh, month on month um, data points that we have here. And um, obviously what we're seeing here is that the vast majority of the data points are in the top right hand corner. Um, so it seems that with Binox, you can you can actually have your cake and eat it. You can you can increase your planning adherence and you can increase your throughput um, at the same time. If we look just here at one data point, uh, just to explain what it means, um, that data point basically means uh, represents an, an average monthly increase in planning adherence, um, and it it represents a 2.4 percent average monthly increase in throughput. Um, so what does that what does that mean um, over the two year period? So these these numbers are compounding. So on a month by month basis, these things are improving, albeit a small bit on a monthly monthly basis. Uh, when we look at it over the two over the twenty four month period, we can see that we've got a forty five percent increase in planning adherence, and we've got a fifty seven percent increase in throughput after twenty four months. So just to show you that really we're not we're not actually um, just cherry picking the data. Um, this is this is all the data that was um, that was looked at, and here you can see that um, these are lines that are fit to the data for um, individual clients. So these these are these are several um, several use cases or several uh, data uh, client data that we've used. Uh, bar the one at the bottom, you can see that on a monthly basis um, that this particular one is for planning adherence. You can see that over time that the planning adherence is improving, um, and so obviously this is this is um, excellent news um, to see that you know that that over time that it's 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 improving. And I suppose you might ask the question, uh, what's what's driving these improvements, and why is it that that we're seeing these uh, um, improvements? I, really, it's down to these maybe five pieces of automation, and maybe other reasons as well, but. But certainly, um, these are the main drivers um, of 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 the of the improvements. Uh, you know, predictive batch tracker, which we look at in a second. Um, the optimization of campaigns, um, the scheduling cobot, which which allows um, which allows us to to essentially manipulate our schedule with very little work with the click of a button. Um, demand creation of work packages, which we look at in a second as well, and machine to machine. Um, communication. So here, if we look, if we look here, this is basically the batch tracker. Um, so we can see immediately by just opening up the batch tracker, we can see that we have a, a sample that's late. It's highlighted here in red, um, and uh, you know it's obviously a, quite a visual system. Uh, we can see immediately which one is which one is late, and that we've got other samples that are on time. And I think in a, this is just a short little video here. Uh, it'll just scroll down. Uh, in a second, and so we've also got some. Uh, we've also got a batch here, uh, number nine, which is uh, highlighted in orange, and an orange um, in this particular batch tracker, it's it's highlighting a batch that is is potentially late, but there's something that we can do about it. So uh, I suppose when you get used to using the system, you understand that you there there are batches within the system that we can actually take action on, and we can improve our situation. Um, and in this case, this is a sample that we can go, uh, or a batch that we can go and look at to see where exactly the problems lie and what can we do about it. Um, as we scroll down here, we can see that uh, for the for the batch that was late, we can see that um, uh, the problem lies in the chemistry team with the HPLC um, uh, test. And over on the right hand side, then we can see that um, it hasn't been approved in QA. So obviously, there's a there's a bit of a delay there. But you can see it's a highly visual uh, system. Here we've got the campaign manager, so it's another part of the automation. Um, so um, based on our our campaigning rules that we've set up, um, you know, at the click of a button, we can uh, we can create our campaigns. So obviously driving efficiency uh, through um, you know getting more samples into a run, um, and this is obviously an important driver of productivity and the improvements that we're seeing. And here we've got this scheduling uh, cobot, 
um, again, you know, we can see that, uh, you know, there, there are 120 tasks there that need to be scheduled. Uh, we've, we've just run the scheduler and it's giving us a, a list of, of tasks that have been um, dished out to uh, the analysts. And then we can look at the schedule board. Um, it gives us a visual representation of all the work that's been, um, that's been allocated to analysts. We can see what kind of capacity they have um, in their day. Uh, we can see details on all the tasks. We can drill into each task to see, uh, for example, that that particular test has got all these batches in it, um, and uh, it's a particular product. We can see all the dates that are um, associated with it as well. And also, we mentioned uh, creation of demand uh, from complex work packages. Uh, so, like a good example of this would be where we've got maybe 200 stability studies, which which could result in possibly 6,000 tests that need to be assigned to the right team at the right time. So, obviously, this is this is a complex bit of um, trying to manage all of that these um, these work packages. This is something that's done automatically. So, so obviously, automating this is take giving back time uh, to management and to supervisors. So a good example of this here is uh, where we have, in this particular case, this is a cell culture um, uh, process in an R&D lab. Um, and you can see here the process is shown in the white boxes. Uh, and then we've got the, um, the laboratory touch points and a QA touch point at the end. Um, so by, by, by running this through the, um, I suppose, the demand, demand creator uh, for complex work packages, uh, it's probably easy enough when we've just got one example of this, but once we start expanding out to multiple uh, batches, uh, we can see how the complexity starts to rise exponentially. Um, and these complexities essentially are their drivers for losses in productivity. Um, and, and by having basically a digital system, it, it offers the opportunity to handle all these complexities. Um, and it also uh, can handle uh, the quantity uh, of data that that's coming into it, and essentially this is done by uh, by an operating model, uh, which is based on a machine learning system. Um, so that machine learning system is then uh, driving uh, driving how these things are scheduled out, um, and it's learning on, a, on an ongoing basis. So those these these um, what we call demand models uh, then fit into um, uh, you can see a visual representation here. So for example, that one batch uh, would potentially have uh, fifteen or twenty um, work packages associated with it, and you can see the sequence of events here um, uh, for that particular work package. And then the last. Kind of driving, I, I would say, automation that's driving some of the improvements um, is the machine-to-machine -machine, uh, communication. And just by way of example here, uh, say for example, we have um, a, a, a high priority sample that arrives into the laboratory, um, maybe in the afternoon. Um, with the with the machine-to-machine -machine communication, basically the the system is automatically updated. So it takes this data, runs it through Binox. And then Binox then goes to the scheduler. It automatically goes to the scheduler uh, to see if it could, if it can find a slot um, to allow for these this new priority, uh, or even potentially um, reschedule some of the um, some of the tasks that have already been scheduled out. So obviously this is done automatically, so there's no need for um, for emails and uh, phone calls and so on, which I, I'm sure we've all experienced, uh, which drives a lot of losses in productivity and you know eats into a lot of time. Um, and all this data obviously is kept up to date uh, and is, it's available to anybody really at any time. And this essentially is 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 optimizing analysts and equipment utilization rates. So um, I suppose maybe to conclude, um, you know, why I ho hopefully we, we've answered those the, the two questions at the top, and hopefully the what to look for part section has been valuable to you, and obviously hopefully we've uh, we've uh, we've shown that the proof is in the pudding. I suppose if we look at why digital, I mean, really we're trying to align the your, our organisation with the with the 
or at least sorry we're trying to we're trying to align the laboratory with the digital with the organization's digital strategy um and then when we look at why now really we're i suppose essentially it's 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 because these mature and proven systems are now available and they're also affordable um and with the what to look for i think the main driver for what to look for really is that is that we get a vertical system that aligns with the laboratory um and i suppose an important part of that as well is that they're listening to laboratories challenges and that they're putting in features and um maybe automations uh, that are allowing the laboratories to 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 manage some of their challenges and hopefully yeah in in the last section we've we've really shown you that the proof is in the pudding with by looking at some of that data so that's the the end of the the presentation um thank you all very much for your time um i really hope that you got some value from that um and uh, here are some of our contact details um if you want to get in touch um and so i think i'll pass it back over to kevin uh for q a thanks kevin yeah thank you very much appreciate it greg great presentation very compelling um and, and there are a couple of questions again i want to for the folks maybe you didn't hear this right in the beginning if you joined a little bit late <clears throat> um, we want to encourage you to ask any questions that you want we won't read your name we won't read your company out just type your question in the question section and uh, we'll do our best to have those have those answered for you i do have a couple on the floor uh, that I want to bring up. So bear with me here one sec. Let me probe that first. Oh, so the first one was, uh, Greg, and let me let me do this. Let me actually, before I do that, let me stop the recording. <clears throat>